Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Um, here, coming out of the spinal cord, you have the uh, dorsal root. And here we can see the ventral root. And here we have the dorsal root ganglion. Now, what happens in this situation, and it really sets the whole pattern for both the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves, the dorsal root ganglion is a sensory ganglion. And the information that is coming into the central nervous system is moving in through this dorsal root area. And the area that, uh, the material that is, information is leaving the central nervous system is going out the ventral root. Now uh, you remember that ventral root then is motor and it is also using the term leaving the central nervous system as efferent. If something is moving toward the central nervous system as it is in the dorsal root, um, we call that afferent. Okay, so sensory or afferent. Um, now, the spinal nerve is made up then of a combination outflow of motor nerves and sensory nerves, and they combine into a single nerve, and we can just identify that right at this point, which is called the spinal nerve. Sorry, I seem to be in trouble with my pointer here, or er, uh, pen. This is the spinal nerve itself. Now, um, let's talk about a little bit about how this uh, works out. The, this is a uh, single nerve system, um, nerve cell system. The cell body for the ventral root resides in the ventral horn, and the nerve cell body then sends a process down, which is going to then pass out, and it will travel through the spinal nerve, and at this point, uh, various fibers can either go up or down. Um, and we have in this case the sensory neuron is located within the dorsal root ganglion. Now there are two processes that come out of that ganglion. Uh, one is coming in from the periphery and is carrying the information of sensory input into this cell body and then the other is sending that information back into the central nervous system. Um, you'll notice that this dorsal root ganglion then, there are no connections between cells at all. This is just simply a collection of cell bodies. Uh, it's a sensory neuron, uh, sensory um, ganglion, and there are no synapses or connections in a sensory ganglion. Perfectly good example of one. Now as I mentioned, when the spinal nerve gets to this point, it can divide up. Some of them are going to go to the dorsal, and we refer to this as the dorsal primary ramus. Or the ventral primary ramus. There are connecting units in here, and I want to talk about those later. They're tied to what is called the autonomic nervous system, but this is the basic pattern of the spinal nerve. It's a system which is made up then of information which is coming to the central nervous system and away from it. Uh, that introduces us into some terms here that I think uh, they're in your outline, uh, but I want to just go over those. They're called nerve components. Um, and the nerve components are 
are listed on your uh, in your outline, but basically uh, those which are referred to as general somatic afferent. Okay, what does that mean? Well, these are going generally to be giving information from the body uh, wall, and that's where the somatic comes in, and it's going to the nervous system, central nervous system, so it's an afferent system. So that this is sensory, general sensory. Uh, that's, um, and this is uh, from body wall again. Body wall and limbs, let's put it even in that. Um, as opposed to, for example, a general visceral afferent, GVA. Well, this is information which is coming in from smooth muscle areas. Um, mostly in glands from smooth muscle and glands. Um, and then uh, this one we'll talk about in more specific. Uh, it's it's uh, got a, a, another component to it which is the part that we really refer to as being the autonomic nervous system in the United States anyway. The, let's look at the counterparts here though. The general somatic efferent, okay, is going to be the general motor supply to the body, motor to skeletal muscle. And the G uh, VE, general visceral efferent, is going to be motor to smooth muscle and glands. And I might just tell you right now that this can be also known as the autonomic nervous system. And that, in turn, is subdivided into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic system. Now, the spinal nerve has all four of these components in it. Um, and we'll talk about especially these two later on. Uh, these first two are the ones that I just diagrammed on our cross-section. Now, what I'd like to do next is to mention that there are also what are called special components. And these refer specifically to um, areas of the head and head and neck of what we call bronchomeric muscle or origin. In other words, from the brachial arches. Some examples. Um, and they, they're also going to be, that, that's one of the areas, and they're also special sensory in the head, and area, head area. So let's go through and list some of these. Special somatic afferent, examples of that are vision and hearing. The special visceral afferent an example of that is taste. And a special visceral efferent, an example of that is going to be, in fact, motor supply to the branchomeric muscles. 
and that probably is where I should have uh, talked about that. The special components are all in head and neck, and it's this component right here that is associated with the SVE, or the special visceral efferent system. The special somatic afferent and special visceral afferent are these two special senses. All right. Um, with that as an introduction to the spinal nerves, as you know, the cranial nerves are um, basically very similar. Um, they can either have the visceral, or they can either have, excuse me, the motor component, the sensory component, or they can have both of them. Um, they can have them singly or, or together. Within the spinal nerve, I do want to say one more thing, and that is that the spinal nerve um, has some very special regions, and you might want to look over some patterns in this area, and the area of the brachial plexus is one of those uh, areas. The ventral primary rami of C, for example, 5, now C, you remember, refers to cervical, 6, C7, and C8, and these are the nerves right here, these are the ventral primary rami, and T1 are going to combine. These rami will come together uh, to form trunks, and these are examples of the trunks, superior, middle, and inferior. Then you notice that we have the divisions where these trunks are going to mix, and I'll just put in a division sign here. And then we form a series of cords, um, and you can see the cords have been formed here. And these will then give rise to terminal nerves. Um, I would suggest that you go to your laboratory guide or to a text or even working with this figure in your handout um, and look at some of these patterns so that you get a feeling for how this brachial plexus comes together. They won't be asking it in detail, but they will be asking it at perhaps these organizational levels of the RAMI, the trunks, divisions, and cords, and they may ask you the specific names of the terminal nerves. I might remind you that as these divisions come together in this area, they form a posterior cord, which is going to the posterior musculature. I'll just put a PC in here for posterior cord. Um, and then a superior, or I guess I should say lateral cord, actually. And a medial cord. which is right there. Um, and it's these that then give rise to the terminal branches. The posterior cord is going to go to posterior musculature in the arm, and the lateral and medial cords are going to go to those which lie in the flexor or anterior compartment of the arm. All right. Um, you have in your handout today a list of the specific cranial nerves and what they do in terms of their motor supply. Okay, now what, as I mentioned, I'd like to do would be to talk specifically about some of the uh, cranial nerves, and we'll just pick a, a very few of them. Uh, we'll start right out here with our first one, uh, and that is that the trigeminal system, of course, is divided up into the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular divisions. I won't even consider the ophthalmic at this point. Um, the Trigeminal ganglion is, of course, located in the middle cranial fossa, giving rise to the maxillary nerve. And the maxillary nerve can be divided up into two portions, one which is going to give rise to the what sometimes is referred to as an outer loop, the nerve supply uh, to the maxillary teeth. The posterior superior alveolar nerves are coming off in this position as the nerve continues across as the infraorbital nerve. It gives up branches to the middle dental plexus, the middle superior alveolar nerve, and the anterior superior alveolar nerve. Uh, and then these will blend to form the superior dental plexus in this area. 
uh, it will then continue onto the face and come out as sensory nerves to that area. Do want to mention with regard to the trigeminal system that the first and second divisions of that system are purely sensory and the mandibular division is the only one that has some motor as well as sensory associated with it. So here we are with the maxillary nerve, a purely sensory one. It has two portions or can be considered in two portions. This outer loop supplying the teeth and another branch which as it gets in this area uh, it'll send branches over to the nose area and to the palate. Let me see if I can get this focused just a little bit. Okay, uh, what happens in this case is, is that the terminal branches of the maxillary nerve are going to enter into the nasal cavity, some of them to the lateral region, and you can get those from this diagram or in Woodburn. Um, others will pass inferiorly, the greater palatine nerve. Others will pass across to the septum and then pass down the septum as the nasal palatine nerve and come in through the incisive canal in this area. Uh, the nasal palatine nerve and greater palatine nerve are going to supply the mucosa of the, of the hard palate and the lesser palatine will come down through the lesser palatine foramina to supply the inferior surface of the soft palate. So these are also terminal branches of the maxillary division of the trigeminal system. The nasal cavity is supplied by other branches uh, well, I just mentioned that the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal system is the other branch that's going to supply this region, as well as, of course, the olfactory uh, sensory nerves in the superior part of it. Let's go on to the mandibular division. Here we have a mixed arrangement. Again, we're up at the trigeminal ganglion within the cranial cavity, exits the foraminal valley. And then as it comes down, the trunk divides itself into a smaller anterior division, which is predominantly motor, with one outstanding exception, the buccal nerve, which is sensory. Make a distinction between this buccal nerve and the buccal branches of the facial nerve, which are motor. This is a uh, sensory branch of the anterior division of the mandibular area, and is going to be supplying skin of the mid face as well as the buccal mucosa. The other branches of the anterior division are motor branches to the muscles of mastication. Um, the posterior division is mostly sensory with the outstanding example then uh, exception of the mylohyoid nerve which is going to come down and supply anterior digastric and the mylohyoid muscle itself. The two major lingual branches or sensory branches are the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve, uh, which are going to supply, of course, the lingual anterior two thirds of the tongue, sensory area to that. And then in this area, we're going to get the supply to the inferior dental plexus. And finally, it exits on the face as the mental nerve supplying skin over the chin. The auriculotemporal nerve is an important branch with regard to supplying sensory supply to the anterior region of the ear. Um, associated with the lingual nerve is a branch of the seventh cranial nerve coming in here. You recall that's the chorda tympani carrying taste as well as parasympathetic fibers to the paraoral region. Here it shows the distribution of the sensory nerves to the face. Uh, the area in yellow here is the distribution then of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal system. The maxillary division is sending out branches that supply this mid-face region of the skin. And the mandibular division is supplying the area here in blue. A point that I want to point out is, do you notice that the angle of the mandible and a good portion of this inferior portion of the cheek um, is supplied by a branch of the cervical plexus which comes up here called the great auricular nerve. It has a facial branch that, spread, that comes up and supplies that region. So the trigeminal system supplies all of the face with the exception of the angle of the mandible and the posterior portion of the head is supplied by the cervical plexus and the uh, first cranial nerve 
or excuse me, uh, second spinal nerve, second spinal nerve coming up and branches of the cervical plexus. Another complex area of innervation, and I apologize for this uh, hastily colored slide, is the dorsum of the tongue. The tongue, as we mentioned when we were talking about the muscles, is very complex. All the muscles are supplied by the 12th cranial nerve, but the mucosa is a more complex thing. The red area is supplied by the lingual nerve for general sensory, and taste is supplied by the chorda tympani from seven. The posterior third of the tongue and overlapping over the circumvallate papillae um, is the area supplied by the ninth cranial nerve or glossopharyngeal. And then in the area of the epiglottis, the area colored in green, we have the supply from the vagus nerve. Now this is mapping then the sensory innervation to the tongue. In these two areas, both taste and general sense are supplied by glossopharyngeal and seven respect, er, 10, respectively. In the anterior region, there's a distinction made. General sensory is from the lingual nerve of the trigeminal system, and the taste is very specific to the seventh cranial nerve or the, and the chorda tympani. And then finally, uh, let's see, this one is, needs a little focusing here. This one I put on here just to remind you of the facial nerve. Its major branch is going to come out through the parotid gland in this region, and its branches will then spread out over the face, supplying the, the muscles of facial expression. Passes through the parotid gland. This is to show you where the parotid gland is and remind you that it fits in here behind the ramus of the mandible. The other major salivary glands are going to be the submandibular gland with its superficial lobe and its deep lobe wrapping behind the mylohyoid muscle. Its duct is passing forward, closely related with the lingual nerve, and comes to the base of the tongue. As it travels in that route, it passes the third major salivary gland, the sublingual gland, whose ducts open directly into the floor of the mouth. You'll notice that the parotid gland duct passes across the masseter and opens opposite the maxillary, second maxillary molar. All right, and with that, what I'd like to do is to shift again to the overhead projection, and we'll talk about the autonomic nervous system. Now, before we go to any of the overhead uh, diagrams that you've been handed out, um, what I'd like to do is talk about a couple of just basic principles. For some reason, the autonomic nervous system is an area that students find difficult. And I think there's some guiding principles you have to remember here. What we're talking about is the general visceral efferent system. Um, so we're talking about a motor system but unlike the motor system that we talked about earlier when we were talking about the somatic efferent system, this is a two-neuron system. Um, one, nervous, uh, one cell body is going to be located in the central nervous system, and the other is going to be located in a peripheral ganglion somewhere. Um, if you keep that in mind, uh, that'll help us get started on it. Um, the other thing is then that an autonomic ganglion is going to have a synapse in it. And let's just contrast these with an autonomic here. As opposed to a uh, somatic or sensory ganglion. You remember we had the dorsal root ganglion as an example of a sensory uh, ganglion, and we said that it had cell bodies in it with processes leading out of it, but no synapses. In the case of the autonomic uh, system, we have got a cell body here, all right, but we have information which is coming into the ganglion from one cell body. There is a synapse between that incoming information and a cell body which then gives rise to a postganglionic fiber. So let me just move this down a little bit. Is that better? Um, 
so that we do have, in the case of an autonomic ganglion, we do have a synapse here, and we're talking about a system in which the central nervous system is here, CNS, and the information is moving out. It is an efferent system. The sensory ganglion, of course, is a system in which the CNS is here, and the information is afferent. So we're talking afferent system and efferent system in terms of these two ganglia and the fact that there's a synapse or not a synapse. Now, we mentioned early on that the general visceral efferent could be divided up into the sympathetic system or the parasympathetic system. The parasympathetic system is the one which is called the vegetative state and the autonomic or the uh, sympathetic is the fight or flight. Or the emergency system. This vegetative is uh, basically uh, eating, sleeping, uh, general behavior during the day. And this one is uh, something you might do just before that exam. Uh, now, the parasympathetic outflow, in other words, we're going to talk about where is the first cell body located. Now, it's got to be in the central nervous system. And in the case of the parasympathetic, it's going to be cranial sacral, in other words, the first order neuron location is that first order location. That's in contrast to the sympathetic system which is the thoracolumbar system. In other words, the first order neuron is located in the thoracic sympathetic cord or the lumbar one. Thoracolumbar. And that's the location for the first order neuron for this system. Now, Let's get right away to the head and neck uh, because I think that's what you're going to mainly be involved with as far as this examination is concerned. Uh, to do that, what I want to do is go back to an earlier diagram that we had for the spinal nerve, and only now I'm going to just simply work with it uh, with regard to the sympathetic outflow and show you how that works up. Um, this is the diagram we had for the spinal nerve. And we're back again at the T level, thoracic level. And for that, then, we can illustrate the sympathetic system. Now, I'm, not, I'm going to do an abbreviated version of this. But the first order neuron is located here. OK, we said it was going to be at the thoracic level. Uh, this one, T6, would qualify. The first order neuron is going to send this information. Now. Remember that this is an efferent system, OK? So it's not going to go out that dorsal route. It's going out the ventral along with the motor. It comes trotting down through here. And I'm going to use this convention of a solid line for the first order neuron. It's going to travel into the spinal nerve. It will overshoot and pass through this connection here. Um, the nerve will then pass into, let's say, a ganglion here, and the second order neuron is going to be located here, and the second order neuron fiber will then reconnect with the spinal nerve, and then at that point, the postsynaptic fibers can travel whichever way it wants to with the spinal nerve. Now, if we're talking about spinal nerves in the thoracic area, we're talking about the blood supply. Uh, or supply to blood vessels and so forth to the thorax. In the head and neck area, the thing that we're concerned about is going to be an extension of this 
system up into the neck. Now, what is this system? Well, this is the sympathetic trunk. Okay, so I'm going to label it down here. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll slide this down here. This is going upward. Uh, this would be at the level then of the cervical sympathetic trunk. Now, in order to make this thing work, I'm going to do an abbreviation here, and we're just simply going to show you what happens in the head and neck. I'm going to start this thing back up, and we're going to go to a large structure up in here called the superior cervical ganglion. That is a sympathetic ganglion, um, and what's going to happen now is that you'll notice that it's up in the neck region. We said this was a thoracolumbar system. Well, the only way that this can get up into this area, if you recall, is that another option for this cell, the first order neuron, is to rise in this sympathetic trunk all the way up to the level of the superior cervical ganglion. And there it will synapse with a second order neuron, and postsynaptic fibers will travel to various points in the head and neck. All of the sympathetic supply to the head and neck comes from the superior cervical ganglion. That's the point of origin of all second uh, order neuron fibers. They can travel, travel or distribute, I should say, by two routes. And let me lower this just a bit and uh, see if I can't get this. It can go, and this is a general pattern for the head and neck, by vessels, and these are by arteries. And there are uh, branches which are going to um, go to both the internal carotid and the external carotid, so that if you know that the area is supplied by a blood vessel, you know how its sympathetic system gets there. There are also what I would call perineural routes. Those are less uh, common, but um, you can, uh, we'll find some examples of those in a minute. But that's the sympathetic system and how it works. Just a uh, quick review back here, and I want to uh, relabel some things I just realized I, you may get asked on the exam. If you get back down here in the thorax, and this connection from the, the uh, sympathetic trunk back over the spinal nerve, the first order neuron is coming um, into the ganglion via the white ramus communicans. And the postsynaptic fiber is returning to the spinal nerve by the gray ramus communicans. And I'll just put down gray ramus C. White rami, therefore, are found only in the area of the thorax and the lumbar region. Gray rami are found at all levels. Uh, and they will be coming off the cord, uh, off the sympathetic trunk at all points to join all spinal nerves. But again, uh, that's a distinction you want to remember. Let's look now at the parasympathetic portion of the autonomics. And for that, um, I want to simply remind you that the parasympathetics are cranial sacral. And the first order neuron, um, first order neuron are associated with the, our, um, okay, this is, let's put it down here again, cranial, craniosacral. 
And in the case of the head and neck, there obviously is this cranial portion that we want to be concerned with. And in terms of the cranial nerves that are associated with the parasympathetic system, the third cranial nerve has, is one of the nerves that has that uh, system associated with it. The seventh cranial nerve, the ninth cranial nerve, and the tenth cranial nerve. Now, in the head and neck, it's just these three that you have to worry about. And if you really want to get uh, tightened down on this, uh, this one goes to the ciliary ganglion. Incidentally, again, the ganglion is the location of the second order neuron. Um, the seventh one supplies two ganglia. It's going to supply the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion. And it will supply, um, okay, the submandibular ganglion. The ninth cranial nerve will supply the otic ganglion. And with these four, you have supplied all of the head and neck. In terms of your national board, it is only going to be the outflow of these three that are going to be critical to you. The vagus nerve and the sacral outflow in terms of the parasympathetics are what supplies the abdominal area, the thoracic cavity, and if you remember, it's the sacral portion that's going to supply the lower abdominal and pelvic area, and it's the, seven, the tenth cranial nerve that will supply the gastrointestinal tract through what's called the splenic flexure, or that portion of the colon, large colon. All right, now let's go to some specifics uh, in the head and neck. We're going to go to the, the salivary glands, and I'd like to use one of your handouts, um, and you've got it right here. Let's first consider uh, what we've got showing. I'm not going to, I'll just tell you that this is the uh, lacrimal gland up here. Um, these glands are glands in a variety of different places. Um, this one uh, would, we will refer to as uh, hard palate, glands of the hard palate. The major uh, salivary glands are shown here. This one would be the sublingual gland. This would be the submandibular gland. And this one, which is in the lower portion down in here, is our parotid gland. All right. What are the major actors? Well. We've just identified that in terms of the parasympathetics, um, we have the seventh cranial nerve, and that's what this is diagrammatically showing here. Um, and that is the facial nerve as it's coming through, and there'll be branches of that which are going to be going to two ganglia that are ident identified here. This ganglion is the pterygopalatine ganglion. pterygopalatine ganglion. And this ganglion down in here is referred to as the submandibular ganglion. All right. Um, now, we mentioned that the sympathetics are going to be getting into these areas uh, via the v blood vasculature, and we've got an example of that in this upper diagram. In this case, we have the internal carotid.
artery. And you remember that one of the branches of the superior, uh, from the uh, superior cervical ganglion was going to travel up with that onto the, on the surface of the uh, internal carotid artery. And it will send a branch which is going to come down here. This is referred to as the deep petrosal nerve. The deep petrosal nerve is a sympathetic nerve. And I'm going to come back and color code these in just a second. This will turn red, which I'm going to use for coloring uh, the uh, sympathetics, and, and green for the parasympathetics. Um, now again here, we have another blood vessel that you're seeing. And this could be a branch of the external carotid system. Um, and in this case, I will just put it in as being the uh, facial artery. And you can see that there are some postganglionic fibers that are traveling on in. So this is the way sympathetics are getting to there. But let's get to the um, business at hand in terms of the parasympathetics. This is the uh, lingual nerve, by the way. Now, let's trace first uh, the parasympathetics into the area of the pterygopalatine ganglion and the mid-face, the glands of the hard palate, soft palate, and nasopharynx. But we're not, in, and for the sake of shortness, I'm not going to label everything here. The seventh cranial nerve is going to give rise to a branch, which is the preganglionic branch, which is going to travel to the pterygopalatine ganglion. There it will synapse, and postsynaptic fibers can go up into the orbit, which we're not going to consider at this time. Um, or they can ride down with the greater palatine, lesser palatine nerves, or other branches of the maxillary system to reach the glands of those regions. Um, the nerve that I've just drawn in green is referred to as the greater petrosal nerve, GTR, petrosal. Petrosal are going to form a nerve right here and I'm just going to put it a little asterisk right there, and I'm going to write it over here, OK? And this is going to be called the nerve of the pterygoid canal. The nerve of the pterygoid canal, then, is a combined nerve. It's the parasympathetic from 7, and it is the postganglionic sympathetics, which have come off of this internal carotid and are traveling to the ganglion. They'll get here. There's not going to be any uh, synapse necessary. They have already synapsed. And then they will continue and transfer information the same way on a perineural route. That gets the autonomics to the hard palate and soft palate area. Let's continue with the seventh nerve and follow it down into the perioral area. We need to get to the sublingual gland and the submandibular gland. The seventh cranial nerve is going to send a branch which will go across the tympanic membrane and then into the infratemporal surface or infratemporal fossa, join the lingual nerve for a way, and then get off. Some of them will synapse in the submandibular ganglion and send postsynaptic fibers to the sublingual gland. Others will travel down and go into the substance of the submandibular gland itself and send postsynaptic fibers, uh, very short ones, to the submandibular gland. Let's go back and name this nerve for you came across the tympanic membrane. It looked like a cord. It's called the chorda tympani.
What else besides the parasympathetics is this carrying? Well, remember that it has parasympathetic and it has taste from the anterior thir two thirds of the tongue. Okay, so the chord of tympani is a uh, a fairly important nerve. It's traveling with the lingual nerve, and that's how it gets there. In terms of the sympathetics, again, we talked about the fact that postsynaptic sympathetic fibers can travel on the vessels, and any vessel that sends a branch to either of these glands, uh, it will also provide then the sympathetic system to the gland itself. Finally, let's drop down here and we'll talk about the parotid gland. The parotid gland is a unique gland. It's located behind the ramus of the mandible and it's important not only for the location of the gland but the fact that it contains in it the seventh cranial nerve, let's just say contents of the parotid fossa. The seventh cranial nerve is going to have branches that pass through it. A branch, the auriculotemporal, of V3, is going to be there. The external carotid artery and the retromandibular vein. All of these things are going to be in the parotid fossa, so that uh, it's, a, it's a fairly busy area. All right, we have the gland here. What are the major uh, features in this? Well, we have here the mandibular division. Um, we have specifically the, uh, the auriculotemporal nerve here. And we can see here um, another nerve, and this is our cranial nerve which gives rise to the first order neuron, and it's going to be the ninth cranial nerve, or glossopharyngeal. And we also have something here called the tympanic plexus, located in the middle ear. Okay, and now uh, again with the parotid gland area, we have some uh, major actors. We talked about the uh, ninth cranial nerve is located here, coming out of the uh, jugular foramen, passes down, this is jugular foramen here. Um, it is going to send a branch back into the middle ear where it forms the tympanic plexus. Um, passing right through the gland, we've already identified the fact that we have the external uh, let me just try this other pointer here, pen. We have the external carotid. Artery. Um, and I think that pretty much takes care of all the major actors here. Now let's start to put this thing together. Okay, the ninth cranial nerve is the location for the first order neuron. Uh, that's where it's located in the central nervous system. The cell body is going to give rise then to that nerve process. It comes through, exits the, uh, maybe I should label that as well. This is our jugular foramen. And just as soon as it exits the jugular foramen, it passes back up. I'm not going to let you even have to worry about that little foramen. Uh, we do that during the course, but not for national boards. Um, go through the tympanic plexus. And then it's going to travel across the middle cranial fossa over to foramen ovale. And it will pass through foramen ovale and it will then synapse near a ganglion which is located medial to the mandibular division of three. Uh, the postsynaptic fibers are going to then travel with the auriculotemporal nerve and travel to the parotid gland in that way. 
I can see that I've forgotten one ganglion. Which one do we have here? This is the last of the head and neck ganglia that you have to worry about. It's the otic ganglion. So that's the, that's the uh, pathway then for the presynaptic fibers, which are on their way to the otic ganglion, and then the postsynaptic fibers travel with the auricular temporal nerve. What's the name of this nerve? Well, this one is our lesser petrosal nerve. Lesser petrosal nerve. We talked about the greater petrosal, the lesser petrosal, and the deep petrosal nerves. The greater petrosal and lesser and uh, deep petrosal were associated with the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion, and this lesser petrosal is associated with the otic ganglion. Now, the sympathetic system, easy, head and neck again. So we're talking about the outflow from the superior cervical uh, ganglion, sympathetic ganglion, and it's branched to the external carotid, and then that travels in a perivascular route to get to the gland. Well, I hope this has helped you in understanding uh, rather quickly the autonomic system and reviewing it. And now, uh, good luck on your examination, and um, I hope that uh, all of you will do a fine job on the exam. Get some sleep night before the exam. That's the most critical feature. You want to work with a clear mind, not a foggy one. Good luck. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.